May 18th, 2023, Montana on Wednesday became the first state in America to ban TikTok. Hey, guys. Bye, guys. Right? Everybody on TikTok does that. Hey, guys. Well, they banned TikTok. Great work, Montana Republicans. Anyone can buy a gun in Montana, but your citizens are finally safe from makeup tips for your hamster. The bill is expected to be challenged in the courts on the notion that it violates freedom of speech. Gee, you think banning TikTok is a violation of freedom of speech? Really? Once again, Republicans complain about the cancel culture and how freedom of speech is under assault. But it is the fascists in America who loathe freedom of speech. Republicans are fascists which means they only want freedom of hate speech. TikTok banned in Montana. Well, I almost didn't go on tonight. I am, as you can see, an emotional wreck. My friend Ariana is not doing well. Her husband, Tom, okay, he's not really her husband, but they've been living together for eight years. Uh, Tom, and Ariana have been living together for eight years, and Ariana just found out that Tom has been sleeping with her, with her friend Raquel. And I mean, between Ariana's skin cancer scare and the eating disorder, and now this, I, I just don't know how she gets out of bed every morning. It, it's very upsetting to watch a close friend go through, through this, and she's not really a close friend. Well, you know, I think she's a friend. You know, she's one of the stars of Vanderpump Rules, and my life revolves around it. They're almost like friends to me, more like family. And I care very deeply about these people. And just, Ariana, just just stay strong, okay? On Tuesday, Sherelle Parker won the Democratic nomination for mayor of Philadelphia, uh, thereby making her pretty much the next mayor of Philadelphia, since Philadelphia is run by Democrats. Sherelle Parker will be the 100th and first, she will be the first mayor of Philadelphia. She will be the 100th mayor and the first female mayor of Philadelphia. Parker is a woman and she's African American, but she's a centrist. Just like Mayor Adams here in New York City, she's African American, but that doesn't make her a lefty. It makes her a Democrat. While she got the support of the unions, Parker ran, promising to get tough on crime and bring back stop and frisk, a highly discredited police procedure where cops walk up to primarily young, poor black men, ask what they're doing, demand to see ID, and then tell them to empty their pockets. The cops always find something and arrest them. Not only is stop and frisk unconstitutional, it doesn't stop crime. It just stops young black men while they're walking down the street. Cops aren't going to stop and frisk a real gangbanger, a real armed criminal, because that's too dangerous. Derek Chauvin put his knee on George Floyd's neck because George Floyd was never any threat to anyone in America, cops mostly, mostly pick on the weak. They protect property and terrorize, terrorize the weak. Brian Cornell, the CEO of retail giant Target, said he expects his company to lose $1 billion this year due to shoplifting. Bullshit. Uh, the CEO of Target, Cornell, blamed quote unquote, organized criminals raiding his stores and making off with products. But when pressed on the subject said it was impossible to calculate how much of his merchandise has been stolen by shoplifters. He can't really tell, he said, the difference between sh the, the merchandise that disappeared because of shoplifting and the merchandise that has disappeared because it's been damaged by employees or never showed up. I'm not buying this new shoplifting scare. Yes, there have been some highly publicized vir viral videos of people shoplifting, 
But there are many, many reasons a big box store's inventory disappears, and it has nothing to do with shoplifting. In fact, I suspect it has absolutely nothing to do with shoplifting. Shoplifting is what you say to divert attention away from the real crimes being committed at the big box stores, like wage theft. Merchandise might be disappearing, might not be. I think if it's disappearing, not, not because of the shoplifters, it's because purchasing agents for these big box retail stores are unsupervised. They pad their orders. They pay for things they know are never going to arrive. They get their kickback and then blame the missing inventory on shoplifters. They're claiming merchandise that was never there has been stolen. If shoplifting is that big a problem, and I don't believe it is, then hire more people. When a customer enters a store, make sure you have customer service. Greet the customer and walk around with them and help them shop. But you don't even need to do that because shoplifting isn't a problem. There are surveillance cameras capturing everything we do inside these big box stores. We know who's stealing stuff. It's all on video. Nobody, for the most part, is shoplifting. Elizabeth Holmes, the founder of biotechnology company Theranos, will begin serving her 11-year prison sentence starting May 30th after a judge this week rejected her motion to postpone the sentence until after her appeal. Holmes was found guilty of criminal conspiracy and fraud when she made false claims about what her blood testing company could do. In 2014, Holmes became a billionaire when Theranos was valued at $9 billion after she had raised more than $400 million in venture capital. They're so busy talking about shoplifting. The, the, this is the real crime. At least she got caught. Uh, she raised $400 million in venture capital, even though there was not a shred of evidence her technology worked. And the federal government kept raising red flags. The, the FDA, Medicare and Medicaid kept saying, this don't work. But she was able to raise hundreds of millions of dollars after trusted luminaries, such as Henry Kissinger, former Secretary of State under uh, Ronald Reagan, George Shultz, and General James Mattis, who later became Trump's Secretary of Defense, they all vouched for her. The experts, the experts like George Shultz, Henry Kissinger, James Mattis, the experts, they all claim to, they said to investors, we vetted her, we looked at the technology and examined the patents and Theranos is a terrific investment. And then some of them got jobs as board of directors on Theranos. The experts, listen to the experts. As I reported yesterday, far-right Christian nationalist Republican Congresswoman Lauren Boebert, who was narrowly reelected last year as a family values conservative, is divorcing her husband of two decades. We are now finding out that Jason Boebert, her soon-to-be ex-husband, who did time for exposing his penis to a 16-year-old minor. Did I ever mention that Lauren Boebert's husband, the family values couple, Lauren Boebert, who calls America uh, a Christian nation, did I ever mention that her husband did time for exposing his penis to a 16-year-old minor? Uh, anyway, he, uh, when the divorce papers were signed this week, uh, two, uh, I'm sorry, they were signed uh, earlier, earlier, I think it was a couple of weeks ago. He didn't take too kindly to the man serving him the divorce papers. Bobert, Jason Bobert, reportedly shouted obscenities. Hmm, how strange. How, it's not something the husband of a congresswoman should be doing. He screamed obscenities at the process server and then let his dogs loose on him. Jason Bobert was reportedly drinking a beer and cleaning his gun while the papers were being served. These are good people. 
cleaning your gun and drinking beer. That's the perfect combination for a moron. Beers and a gun. What could possibly go wrong? More on that bombshell Rudy Giuliani sexual assault lawsuit. Former Attorney General Bill Barr on Wednesday suggested that he wouldn't be surprised if Rudy Giuliani tried to sell presidential pardons at $2 million apiece. If you remember, in court papers for that sexual assault lawsuit filed against Giuliani on Monday, his accuser said Giuliani told her that as President Trump's personal attorney, he was able to sell pardons, pardons from the outgoing President Donald Trump for millions of of dollars. Former Attorney General Bill Barr during the interview on Fox News said, I hope he didn't do that, but I just don't know. Strippers at a nightclub in North Carol, uh, strippers at a nightclub in North Hollywood, California, have become the first topless dancers to have union representation. After a 15th month battle with the owner of Star Garden Topless Dive Bar. The strippers will now be represented by the Actors Equity Association. The Actors Equity Association. Well, they're strippers. It's like it's not like any of them would want to join SAG. In two th- yeah, I went for that. In 2018, the California State Supreme Court ruled that strippers are not independent contractors and are employees thereby creating an opportunity for them to form a union. In 1997, strippers working San Francisco's Lucky Lady formed the Exotic Dancers Union, but the club later folded along with the union. You know, this all gets a lot of attention. Oh, the strippers are forming a union. It's a golden age of union organizing bullshit. There are fewer union members today than there were last year. America right now has the smallest percentage of union membership in 100 years. All this talk about strippers unions, Amazon unionizing, Starbucks unionizing. And by the way, Starbucks still hasn't recognized any of those unions, nor has Amazon. And now we're, you know, the writers are on strike. Uh, We're not creating the labor movement we need. You can't have a union movement without class consciousness. We need class consciousness. Stop identifying with the rich. Stop identifying with management. They're not on our team. According to a new Gallup survey, Americans are more depressed than ever before. Nearly 30% of those polled say they have been diagnosed with depression sometime during their life. That's 10% higher than how people responded to that question back in 2015. This country is not working when that many people are depressed. Nearly 18% of Americans now say they are being treated currently for depression. If you or somebody you know is suffering from depression, call your healthcare professional immediately and tell them to stop practicing medicine until Joe Biden signs Medicare for all into law. Eventually, we have to start blaming the doctors. The doctors could just stop working, only treat, just show up at the emergency room and refuse to practice medicine until we get Medicare for all. Eventually, the doctors have to be held responsible for how we're all being ripped off by the health insurance companies. We have to put the health insurance companies out of business and the doctors have to get on board. Ultimately, they're the ones failing to make the diagnosis of a cancer in our society and that is called for-profit health insurance. I'm starting to blame the doctors for remaining silent on all this. Joe Biden is quietly putting together a team to, uh, (laughs) I like that, little Photoshop. Uh, Joe Biden is quietly putting together a team to investigate America's rarely talked about shortage of drugs. Very few people are talking about the shortage of drugs here in America, legal drugs. Forget the fentanyl problem. 
We have a drug shortage. A new report shows that drug shortages were up 30% last year. Many of these drugs in short supply are life-saving cancer treatments and eye drops that literally keep people from going blind. This is not being reported. There are serious shortages of drugs here in the United States, and people who are very sick are not getting chemotherapy and dying. A Senate Homeland Security hearing held in March of this year revealed that the FDA has difficulty unraveling the pharmaceutical industry's opaque supply chain, a purposely opaque supply chain with critical medicines, life-saving medicines getting manufactured in China and India to maximize profits at the expense of American lives. Now, 90% of all drugs here in America are generic. And most companies that produce generic drugs are struggling to remain profitable. Well, it's time to nationalize Big Pharma. It's time to nationalize the drug companies. We finance their R&D. We might as well own them. We're the wealthiest country in the history of civilization. And the best medical advice anyone can provide is don't get sick. Great country you got here. Well, on Wednesday, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed a new law forbidding anyone over the age of 18 from using a bathroom that doesn't correspond with the sex they were assigned at birth. I, was, I didn't even know I was assigned a sex. I, I, I didn't know that. Violators now in Florida will be charged with criminal trespassing. Odd that Ron DeSantis would be so obsessed with bathrooms given he doesn't give a shit about anything other than himself. This is the most constipated man in America, and he's obsessing with bathrooms. When has he ever needed to go to the bathroom, that tight ass? The law is impossible to enforce. It requires bathroom vigilantes to stand guard inside bathrooms and demand you show proof of gender. That sounds like a pickup line to me. Bathroom vigilantes. This is a right-wing dystopian nightmare, essentially designed to grant bigots in Florida carte blanche to harass anyone who doesn't look like them, or more likely, permission to harass someone that they're secretly attracted to. This bill is like the one North Carolina passed in 2016, resulting in the NBA moving their all-star game out of the state to protest the bathroom bill. There, was, uh, there were several boycotts of North Carolina after, this, after their bathroom bill. And because the rest of the country began to boycott North Carolina, the Republican governor wasn't reelected a year later, and that evil bathroom bill was repealed. So what is it going to take, liberals, to stand up to Ron DeSantis's Florida? When he's not signing anti-LGBTQ community bills, he's arresting African Americans for trying to vote and forbidding the teaching of black history in our schools. Now, it's really easy for liberals to call for a boycott of North Carolina. But where are the brave voices calling for a boycott of Florida? Florida is no longer a swing state. It's red. Now, Disney World has done its share standing up to DeSantis. So I don't think a boycott of Disney World is in order. If anything, we should be supporting Disney. But the rest of Florida? Which side are you on? I'd like to know which side these corporations and businesses in Florida and, and cities and tourist attractions, which side are you on? 
Right now, the liberals in America are remaining silent on a boycott of Florida. And because liberals in America refuse to stand up to Florida like we stood up to North Carolina, Ron DeSantis, this fascist bigot, thinks he can become president. It starts with not giving Florida our money. DeSantis has had a series of bill signing ceremonies this week in which he outlawed gender transition care for minors. This week, he officially forbid children from attending drag shows. Big problem. Big, big problem in Florida. You know, they're, they're, they can't educate their kids. Uh, highest dropout rate in America. But they're making sure children uh, can't attend drag shows. And Ron DeSantis, thank God, He's put an end to the use of pre preferred pronouns in schools. That makes for a really smart citizenry. These kids are going to be really well educated. After one of the bill signing ceremonies this week inside a Tampa Christian school, he went to a, a Christian school to sign one of these bills. Separation of church and state, anyone? DeSantis said after signing the bill, we need to let our kids just be kids, right? Let kids just be kids, no matter how that kid was born. Just let that kid be the kid he was meant to be. And then if he turns out that he was meant to be someone we don't approve of, let's continue to create conditions that will hasten that kid's suicide. DeSantis is a sadist. That's what fascists are. They're sadists. As a JAG officer, he was there at Gitmo while they were waterboarding, and he did nothing to stop it. DeSantis then called Florida a citadel of normalcy. Normalcy. Let's see how his kids turn out. Florida's Department of Education will be conducting an on-site investigation of the school where a fifth grade teacher showed her class Strange World, a Disney film featuring a gay character. The Office of Professional Practices of Florida's State Education Department will be interviewing the students who suffered through the film, as well as the parents of those kids to determine what types of PTSD the movie inflicted on them. This is not a joke. Because of the investigation, the teacher who showed the Disney film announced that she would finish the term but wouldn't return in the fall. Governor Ron DeSantis's parental rights and education law gives parents more of a say in their child's education because that's, that's what I want. Florida parents setting syllabuses. Syllabi? Syllabi? This is why I'm not a teacher. I don't know the plural of syllabus. You don't want any parents determining what gets taught and doesn't get taught in school. The parental rights and education law also forbids teachers from discussing gender and sexual identity before the eighth grade. That is just insane. Almost as insane as showing a classroom of fifth graders a Disney film. Why is a teacher showing her students a Disney film in the middle of the school day? Phone in sick if you don't want to work. Uh, we're now getting reports that the Texas legislature just passed a ban on hormone and puberty blocking treatments and surgeries for transgender children. The bill expected to be signed by the governor, Greg Abbott, would make Texas the largest state in America to persecute the LGBTQ community. Meanwhile, in Texas, a one-year-old boy was shot by his four-year-old brother. The child, as well as Texas's incredibly lax gun laws, are expected to survive. But focus on puberty blockers, you idiots. The leading cause of death in America, guns. Look that up, Google that. Leading cause of death in America for children, I'm sorry, the leading cause of death for children in America is guns. 
Google that. It used to be car accidents. It used to be cancer. Now, the leading cause of death for children in America, guns. But these Republican deviants in Texas are obsessing on puberty blockers. It's a nation run by morons. How did we let the morons take over? Worthless, craven morons. In an interview on CNBC, Elon Musk called working from home, quote unquote, morally wrong. Working from home is morally wrong. This from the same man who was just subpoenaed by the Virgin Islands in their Jeffrey Epstein lawsuit. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Please like this video. Please share this video. Please comment on this video. This is primarily an audio podcast, and we drop new episodes every day of the audio podcast that's filled with interviews, long-form conversation, some sketches. And we are now dropping our podcast on YouTube every single day at 9 a.m. on my channel. I didn't think there'd be interest in an audio podcast, but there seems to be a, you know, some, a, li a little interest in, in our podcast. So please subscribe to this channel and subscribe to the, the podcast. It's just audio, but it has some of the greatest, I talk to some of the greatest minds in America and uh, please share this with people uh, who you think might learn something. Well, on October 31st, 1997, Princess Di was killed after her car going 60 miles per hour hit a pillar inside a Paris tunnel. Diana was trying to avoid as many as 30 photographers chasing her on motorbikes. As she lay dying, waiting for an ambulance, the paparazzi continued to snap away. They took pictures of her as she bled to death. Two separate inquests later determined Diana's driver was impaired, combining alcohol with prescription pills, and perhaps her death could have been avoided had he not been speeding and had she been wearing her seatbelt. From the moment her engagement to Charles was announced. Princess Di was terrorized by the paparazzi, and it is received wisdom that she was killed by them. I believe that. I do believe the paparazzi killed Princess Di. But in all fairness, the paparazzi didn't order Diana not to wear her seatbelt or put her life in the hands of a chauffeur who thought it was prudent to engage in a high-speed chase with photographers through the streets of Paris while he was high on alcohol and prescription pills. Tuesday night, here in New York, Diana's youngest son, Harry, and his wife, Megan, were in Manhattan for the Women of Vision Awards at the Zigfield Ballroom because that's what the world needs, more award shows. By Wednesday morning, splashed across the media were reports that the royal couple feared for their life, avoided a catastrophe. They reportedly, according to Harry and Meghan, they almost got killed in New York City during a two-hour high-speed car chase through the streets of Manhattan as they tried to avoid photographers in a scene reminiscent of the one that killed Harry's mom. Here in Manhattan, we were told that they came within inches of a fatal car crash. Now, I understand that Harry is afraid that the paparazzi is going to do to his family what they did to his mom. Uh... So Harry and Meghan's people put out reports that the paparazzi endangered not just the lives of Harry and Meghan, but New York City pedestrians as the photographers, they said, were riding in cars, on, on motorbikes. They ran red lights and jumped curbs onto sidewalks. 
That's rush hour <laughs> in New York. What, what do you, you think you're special? That's how, that's how that's how we roll in New York City. But apparently, uh, they were upset because they were uh, driving on the sidewalk to catch up with their limousine. Uh, you know, this is New York City, and if the paparazzi were in fact riding on sidewalks, creating traffic jams, running red lights, I'm pretty certain the lives of the paparazzi were more in danger from angry New Yorkers than the pedestrians or Meghan and Harry were. Because that shit don't fly here in Manhattan, where the official slogan is, I'm walking here. So, later, on Wednesday, New York City police did confirm that, yes, photographers did get out of control. But we are now learning it wasn't a two-hour high-speed chase. Of course it wasn't, because that stuff doesn't happen. There's no way high speed in midtown Manhattan is like four miles an hour. Uh, it just doesn't happen. A after their event at the Zigfield, Harry and Meghan rode to a police precinct, hopped out of their limo, and made it safely back to the apartment they were staying at simply by being put into an ordinary cab which rode undetected by the paparazzi. So I am rooting for Harry and Meghan. I am. I think they're important, and I think... Harry was dealt a set of cards, and he's, I think he's a great man. And I think Megan is a, I, I think she's great. I think they're great. I do. Even though they're best friends with Tyler Perry, who runs a non-union studio in Georgia that is notorious for screwing over the writer's union. Tyler Perry, no friend of the writer's guild. So I do... Personally, I, I, I think Meghan and Harry should sever ties with Tyler Perry. Uh, but here's the deal. Uh, Princess Di was hounded by the paparazzi. And the paparazzi are evil. But she didn't wear her seatbelt. And her driver was drunk. And he was speeding. And her last words were, faster, doty, faster. There was some thrill of escaping the paparazzi. I'm not passing judgment on anybody. I have no right to pass judgment. I'm just throwing this out here because uh, I don't understand this game, this cat and mouse game with the paparazzi. If you don't want to be photographed by the paparazzi, and again, I've never, <laughs> nobody wants to take my picture except the occasional mugshot when I'm arrested, but that's a whole other story. If you don't want the cat and mouse game, maybe don't stay at the Ritz-Carlton. Uh, maybe put on a wig, dress like a schlump, borrow my clothes, and I can assure you, you'll be invisible. Nobody will recognize you. Again, it must be horrible being trailed by photographers. Uh, and I'm rooting for Harry and Meghan. I have tremendous respect for them. It's terrifying. His idiot father, his craven father, disowned him. Harry has to pay for his own security detail. Can you imagine a father doing that to a son? Charles has left Harry on his own. And his, his own grandkids and daughter-in-law. Security, there are no crazy people in America. You're on your own. Harry has to find his own security. And that's really expensive. So... I, I just don't understand uh, what's going on. Something's, something isn't right. Uh, they should, they have plenty of money now. They should figure this paparazzi thing out. I, I, I read the book, read the book. It's incredible the way they're not left alone. It, it, it's incredible. Uh, I, it just... It, I don't understand it, why this can't be solved. I, I don't. Um, 
I don't know. It, it seemed, in New York City, we, I don't think we have this problem. We have the UN here, uh, world leaders, and the president, wealthy billionaires and movie stars come here all the time. This stuff, it doesn't seem to happen in New York City. People can come to New York City, really famous people come here and they can be left alone for some reason. I don't know. Is it that hard to avoid the paparazzi in New York? I read Spare and it's incredible what the helicopters and the paparazzi are, are capable of. Uh, Listen, let me, let me make a suggestion here. Uh, my sister and I were talking, and she lives in Teaneck, New Jersey. Let me just try this. Next time, Harry and Meghan, if you're watching, next time you have to attend a, an event in New York, stay with my sister in Teaneck, New Jersey, and, and we'll drive <laughs> you into the city in the Corolla and, and drop you off. Nobody will notice you. And when the event is over, don't go out the front door. Go out the back wearing my clothes and jeans, and, and we'll be there. We'll pick you up in the Corolla. We'll drive you back to Teaneck. We'll even pay for the toll. I don't know. I, I, I don't understand why it's so hard to outwit, to outwit a bunch of maggots the paparazzi, they're maggots who can only put food on their tables by photographing celebrities. It seems like it shouldn't be that hard to outsmart these morons. I don't know. Then again, I've never been hounded by the paparazzi. So I don't know. I don't know. Well, Formula One canceled the Grand Prix in Italy after 5,000 people were forced to evacuate their homes and at least eight people died from 20 inches of rain in fewer than 36 hours. Two dozen rivers throughout Italy are reportedly overflowing right now. Formula One is scheduled to have 23 races around the world this year. So far, no word as to whether the one in Italy will be rescheduled. Um, now this rain, is the result of climate change caused by the combustion engine which Formula One celebrates. A Formula One season reportedly generates 256,000 tons of CO2 emissions. That's just from the cars racing and all the other transportation necessary to hold the event. 200 and 56,000 tons of CO2 each season. A commercial airline would have to fly round trip between New York and Europe 227 times to release that much CO2. Uh, Formula One is, is killing our planet and creating the conditions that caused the Formula One race in Italy to be canceled. Formula One, their races are an orgiastic fetishization of the combustion engine, which is one of the major contributors to climate catastrophe. The very same climate change that is killing people tonight in Italy and forcing Formula One to cancel its race. This is the combustion engine that's causing this. Formula One was canceled this week, not on account of rain. Formula One was canceled on account of Formula One. I get it. People like the combustion engine. They also like cigarettes, fast food and sugar. Find something else you like because this stuff is killing you. How's it possible that Jay Leno and Jerry Seinfeld think it's hip and or socially responsible to produce television shows celebrating their obsession with cars. These are childish toys that are destroying the planet. Grow up, Jerry. Grow up, Jay. Okay, your joy rides are killing us. Meanwhile, the 76th annual Cannes Film Festival is taking place this week. It would be nice if American actors boycotted the festival to show solidarity with the Writers Guild, which is striking 
all the studios hawking their wares at the Cannes Film Festival. The Cannes Film Festival is being held while millions of French workers are protesting the French government's decision to raise the retirement age from 62 to 64. This has prompted several French union leaders to threaten to shut the festival down by cutting off its power lines. Their unions are a little different in France. The city of Cannes, however, where the festival is being held, has banned all protests during the entirety of the festival, right? The Cannes Film Festival, they have documentaries. This is where Michael Moore became famous with his documentaries. We're big proponents of freedom of speech. The word is so important until you actually want to stage a protest in the city of Cannes during the festival. God forbid actors, producers, directors, and writers have to be challenged. See, they're protecting the Hollywood producers and directors and actors. They, everybody gets to walk the red carpet in con with impunity and not appear to be crossing picket lines. They're not going to be accused of not showing solidarity with French workers or members of America's Writers Guild. I know this is hard to believe, but here in America, there was a time when people didn't cross picket lines and there was actually a time when people created their own picket lines and refused to show up to, I don't know, a studio event in solidarity with one of the Hollywood workers unions that's on strike. That was, there was a time that that happened in America before that piece of shit Ronald Reagan became president. That time has passed because of the concentration of ownership in Hollywood. Hollywood is owned by four or five studios, including Disney. And uh, all it takes is a few studio heads not to like your politics, to think you're a troublemaker, to think you're a union rabble rouser, and you're not gonna get any work. So it's a climate of fear. Actors who whose responsibility, writers and directors whose responsibility is to be on the side of labor. They have to feed their family and they're forced to show up to these things, even though they're disgusted by this. Uh, if you're a writer or an actress or a director, you're a member of a union. And too many Writers, actors, directors have been co-opted by management. They've been turned into producers. Anytime you see a writer, an actor, or a director taking a producer's credit on a television show or a movie, it means they've been forced, or maybe voluntarily, they've gone over to the dark side. They've betrayed their union. You know, I've talked about Alec Baldwin and the movie Rust. The cinematographer died because Rust was shot, you'll pardon the expression, shot on the cheap. They ended up using a non-union crew after the union crew complained of working condition. Here's the crime Baldwin committed. He was a producer of Rust, which means as an actor, and I, I don't know this for a fact, I'm 99% sure this is how he made his money on Rust and how he makes money on a lot of these art house movies. Uh, he takes a producer credit and he's not the only one. Uh, he gets paid next to nothing as an actor. He probably takes the, you know, the minimum that you pay an actor for a movie and uh, and says, aren't I great? I'm taking, look how, look how little I'm getting paid to be an actor. What he doesn't say, and I'm not 100% sure that this is what happened. Uh, I'm 1,000% sure this is what happened. What he took was a giant piece of the back end and the front end 
as a producer, collected his producer fees, does that quietly, and uh, and then he gets to say, I I'm working f basically for minimum. I'm just an ordinary actor. And everyone says, gee, he's just uh, the salt of the earth, isn't he? Uh, but that means, what that means is, all the money he makes, the bulk of his money, comes to him as a producer, and none of that money as a producer goes to the actors' union. All that money he gets doesn't pay into the pool that provides health benefits and pensions for all the other union members. So when you read the credits, when you see an actor or a writer or a director also listed as a producer, uh, it means they're voluntarily or involuntarily screwing their unions. On Rust, Baldwin, super liberal, can't wait, you know, to spew the, the claptrap of solidarity with unions. But on Rust, it ended up being a non-union crew, and he went over to the dark side, and he was listed as a producer. And producer is a bullshit credit. It's just a credit so they can pay you instead of pay into the union. He wasn't working budgets. He was a producer, so the bulk of his money, he was listed as a producer, so the bulk of his money wouldn't have to go to the unions. He was a producer, partly, to screw over the unions. If you're being paid a million dollars to act in a movie, or direct a movie, or write a movie, it should be paid to you as a writer, a director, an actor, not some of it being paid to you as an actor, writer, or director, and then the rest of it paid to you as a producer. You're screwing your union by doing that, and you're forced to do it because there's no class consciousness in America. They make you a producer so you identify with your oppressor. That's the psychological trick played on the labor movement here in America. They get you to identify with management. We're part of a team, let's work together. We're not a team. We're not a team, they're two sides. You know, these rich billionaire pricks love buying football teams. Uh, why do you have to, play against one another. Why can't you just make one big team on the field and, and give each other back rubs? No, there's a dialectic here. There are two teams. I'm not management. Management is my enemy. I want to defeat management. That's the, the game that has to be played in order for the labor movement to thrive once again. You accept who you are. If you are working for a living, then don't identify with the richest 1%. Take their money. All right. I want to know what Alec Baldwin did as a producer. I want to know. He was listed as a producer on Rust. What did he do as a producer other than maybe go out to dinner with some rich people? You know, do some, uh, make it rain so they'd invest in Rust as some sort of money laundering tax dodge. Well, one of America, one of America's favorite actors, Johnny Depp, showed up for the Cannes Film Festival this week. His new movie, in which he plays Louis XV, kicked off the festival. Hmm. Now, if you recall, Depp won a much publicized defamation lawsuit against his ex-wife, Amber Heard, who had accused him anonymously, she didn't mention his name in an op-ed piece, for the, she wrote a piece in the Washington Post, and intimated that Johnny Depp was physically abusive towards her. And so Johnny Depp filed a defamation lawsuit, which he ended up winning, I think in Virginia. Depp won that defamation case. I don't know why. 
But he lost a more important defamation case in Great Britain against The Sun, which published a story a few years back accusing Johnny Depp of being a wife beater, quote unquote, wife beater. The judge in that case ruled that The Sun's story of Depp being a quote unquote, wife beater, this is what the judge said. He said that story was, quote, substantially true. In that trial, Depp was found to have physically abused Amber Heard 12 times. Amber Heard has testified that Johnny Depp sexually assaulted her during their marriage. Johnny Depp kicks off the Cannes Film Festival this week. Where's Amber Heard? Haven't heard from her. She retired to the Spanish island of Majorca with one of her kids because no offers for acting have shown up. Nobody's hiring her. It's a culture of fear. Why don't women report rape and sexual assault? Look what happened to E. Jean Carroll. Amber Heard. America turned on Amber Heard. You saw the videos. You, you've read about the defamation case in, in Great Britain where the judge said it's substantially true that Johnny Depp is a wife beater. And there he is kicking off uh, the Cannes Film Festival. This whole system, not just America, the whole entertainment industry is a culture of fear. Don't speak up. If you speak up, you'll never work again. Class consciousness. Do not identify with anybody who's a multimillionaire, including actors. Don't identify with the wealthy. Get their money. Get their money. Elect politicians who will get their money for you. For the past 40 some odd years, there's been a redistribution of wealth in this country flowing upwards. They get all the tax breaks. The rich get all the tax breaks and we have to pay, pay them. And then when they screw up, we bail them out. That's the show. Thank you for listening. Please like this video. I've been told that's the best way to help me. Other than uh, <laughs> there are other ways to help me, but you're not going to do that. Uh, so please hit the like button. That seems to guarantee that I end up in your feed more often. I read all the comments, so please comment. I'm always curious. And I, when I'm wrong, I correct myself. Uh, and I will right now. Franklin Roosevelt died in 1945, not 1944. Somebody commented on the mistake I made, and I'm correcting myself. Uh, with Howie Klein, I said he died in uh, 1944. I was wrong. So correct me in the comments section, please. I get ideas, topics from the comments section. Please share this with your friends. That really helps me. If you want to help me, uh, if you want to hurt me, hit the dislike button. That's, that's, uh, that's how you can hurt me. And don't send it to your friends. Uh, post it on social media. What else? Subscribe to the channel. Please subscribe to my newsletter. It comes out every Friday night. Every Friday night for the past three years, I've been hosting office hours where I get to meet my listeners and... I invite you to come to office hours. The, it's done on Zoom. You don't need Zoom. You, you can also phone in. We provide you with a, a number to phone in. And this Friday, we have comedian John Ross. And I don't have it in front of me, but it's going to be great. I'll let you know on tomorrow's show. Thank you to the mods. And I guess that covers it. Right? I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak.